picture the face of Jesus. Jesus. 
Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to worship together. I hope that you're as moved by the thoughts and the words and the music and the joyful noises, Father, that I hear. I just ask that you would close our eyes to any distractions around us and that you would open our ears to the truth that you want to share with us this morning. I just ask that you uh, would create a deep work in us today, that you would send us all home with something special, exactly what it is that you want us to hear from today's message, Father. We just we love you and we praise you and we thank you for the work that you're doing, both the work that we see and the work that we can't see yet. God, we love you and we praise you. Amen. Good morning, church family. Uh, Good morning. That was, that was beautiful. Um, so there's a lot of faces I haven't got to meet yet, but my name is Alex. My wife is Kristen. We've been coming to Brainerd for over a year. Today I'd like to do some announcements for what is coming in the next coming weeks for our church. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. First is, how many of you have ever lived in the same house as with, with uh, someone who's been like 12 to 18 years old? Raise your hand. I have. Now keep those hands up if um, you've ever had someone disciple you to Christ or mentored you and been a spiritual mentor. Keep those hands up, anyone? So if your hands are raised, you should pay attention to this first point. On October 21st through the 23rd is our student fall retreat at Shaco Springs. It's near Talladega, Alabama. Um, we would love for all of our students who are not aware of this to know that the deadline is this coming week, October 1st, but there is a need for all of us, particularly those who raised your hands, we need seven male and six female volunteers to help mentor these students. Um, so if you've ever shared the same household, you are already meet the qualifications. So if the Lord is calling you or you just want to serve the, your church family, serve the next generations, serve the young folk in our church, be a great opportunity. But again, the deadline is this next week, but in order to make this event happen, we need adult volunteers. Um, secondly, we have the, the Church Fall Fellowship. This is coming up on October 30th. This will be following the service up to 3 p.m. So don't make any lunch plans after the service. Just stay here on campus. We'll have a great time here in the BX soccer field right outside this facility. We'll get to spend a lot of fellowships together, meet new faces, have a good time. I'm sure there'll be food involved. We are a Baptist church. Um, and then finally is the foster care backpack project. So starting October 23rd, so the Sunday that the student retreat ends, there'll be backpacks available and they'll have a little description for what needs to be filled in that backpack for some of our foster kids. Um, and we want to have a good drive and be a grassrooted movement to where we can have a lot of backpacks completed by November 20th. Um, so every time you go into Walmart or making your online grocery orders, go ahead and just start ordering a couple extra things that can go in those backpacks and anticipate for how we can serve some of the youth in our area. Um, moving on to our offerings, there are three ways we can give. Um, through the blue box in the back, if you have a, an offering you can contribute today. Um, online, in case you didn't bring anything today. Or you can always mail it to the church office or drop it off in person during office hours. All three are great options. Um, so let's be thank faithful in worshiping the Lord in that way. And then I'd like to just transition this time to prepare for Pastor Kevin. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare to worship and service. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all together and this church body and that we get to worship as a church family freely. Um, I pray you prepare our hearts to serve you in the next following weeks with all of these opportunities you've given us to serve in our church. But be with Pastor Kevin as he is a vessel for your service this morning um, and what Second Peter has to bring to us. I pray you just prepare our hearts again. In your name I pray, amen. What a great time of worship today, amen. I'm going to let y'all try again. You know, it's my routine. What a great time of worship today. Yeah, so uh, it's just been a really, not just uh, 
this morning singing together, but it's been a great weekend to be at Brainerd Baptist Church. You've seen a picture of who we are and what we're about. And so we are about at Brainerd Baptist delivering the word, discipling the believer, and deploying the church on mission. And so you've just seen a beautiful picture of who we are, that we believe that we help those that are far from God become committed followers of Jesus, all the way from the scenic city to the nations. You saw a picture of that. You also uh, saw, if you were around in our church this weekend, we had a discipleship happening on our campus. We had this room full of ladies on Friday and Saturday. If you participated in that, I heard it was an awesome thing. We had a bunch of dads and their kids that hiked up uh, on the trail the other day, and we came back. We didn't lose any kids. It was a great the success for the dads on that time. We, we were able to walk through what it looks like to disciple the believer, even walking up a trail together. And now we arrive today at, uh, to hear God's word delivered, to hear uh, what God has to say for us in, in his word. At Brainerd Baptist, we're committed to expository preaching. That means that we're committed to open up God's word, to read it, to understand what it says, to explain it, to leave it exposed. That's what expository preaching is. And then we decide and we're committed to explaining what we do with that, how that makes a difference in how we live out our lives as we walk out of here in, in our worship services. That's who we are. We preach through recently books of the Bible. And so uh, we've gone, gone through First Peter. We're almost finished with Second Peter. We're going to walk into Nehemiah. Mark is still... A, 50-week memory that lots of us have of how long we spend in that book. We do that for a reason. We do it because we believe that there's power in God's Word, and we like, uh, we want you to know, we want to represent that to you. Even if we don't preach through God's Word in a full book, uh, in the pulpit, we go through that in our small groups. And so if you're in a life group, you've probably gone through a book like James or some other book of the Bible. You've uh, been in a Hebrews class on Sunday night. We believe in the importance of working through an entire book or a large passage of Scripture. We think it allows us to dig deep into God's Word it also gives uh, pastors and teachers some accountability that we're not just bouncing from the text that we want to teach or that we're uh, skipping over hard passages. Today, we're continuing our study through Second Peter. Uh, that we're preaching expositionally through that book. Peter began the book with some encouraging words, words that pastors love to preach. He gave a message like this as he began. He said, God's divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through knowledge of, the, of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That's good news. That's encouraging news. It was an encouraging word. And then Peter goes on to encourage this church, a church that is going through a time of persecution, a church that has false teachers creeping in and sneaking in. Peter goes on to talk about how God is trustworthy that we can trust in our Lord. Even as we suffer, we can trust in Him. And He lays out that we can know and trust in our Lord because of God's trustworthy Word, that the Bible that comes to us through the prophetic Word of the Old Testament and the apostolic witness of the New Testament, that we can trust in it. And by trusting in it, we can know a trustworthy God. Those are the kind of sermons that as a pastor that I love to preach. I love to encourage. I love to point people to those encouraging things, especially when they're walking through a time of suffering or when there's hard times happening in the church. This week, though, will be the third week preaching on false prophets. False prophets don't fall into the encouraging sermon category. It's not one of those that I wait, look forward to every week. Wow, this is going to be a, just a really encouraging word for those that, that get to hear it. But it's still an important word. It's an important word because uh, we need to know and be able to discern who these false prophets are. I want to confess to you today that preaching through these uh, this passage, chapter number two in Second Peter, has been hard for me. It's been hard. It's been uh, one of those passages, three weeks now of less encouraging words. It's been hard because for me, dealing with, with false teachers touches my life. Because as I've looked at these passages, I've known men that I trusted 
men that I put myself under. And as time went on, I, I came in to find out that they were men that shouldn't have been trusted that either by their lives or by their words, they were actually false prophets. As I read these passages and as I've studied these passages, I think about friends and family that I know that have heard false teaching. And rather than stick to what God's word is, they've been carried away because of false teaching that allowed them to continue to walk in sin or promise them freedom and sin that they wanted. It was teaching that tickled their ears and they walked away from the Lord and walked away from the gospel. And so as your pastor on this day, you need to know that it's personal for me. Three weeks of preaching about false teachers is, has kind of worn me out. And so uh, hopefully it's not worn you out. I'm not gonna wear you out today, but you need to hear from me how important I think it is that we're able to discern who these men are and so that we aren't carried away by them. There's a way that we can preach on, on false prophets and we can, it can be easy. I could name a couple uh, famous prosperity gospel folks, teachers that you've seen on the internet or you've seen on TV. I could name some of those name it, claim it folks and we could set them up like straw men and we could beat them up like those little toys that kids get, the inflatable ones where you punch it and it falls down and it flops right back up. You know those toys. We could have had a lot of fun for three weeks just doing that. But I don't believe that teaching and focusing on that type of false prophet is very helpful for us. We need to be on guard against false prophets who are more uh, like us. False prophets who say the right thing most of the time, but not all the time. False prophets whose words may be good, but their life and their character may not be good. As a pastor, as I've looked at these passages, as I've allowed them to work in my life, there's two warnings that you need to know that have already been working in me. The first one is, is that I need to grow in my discernment of identifying who these men and false teachers are. In my life, I've heard false teaching that's attracted me to false teachers, and I've known these men, and I ask myself over and over, how did I fall for that? And the second warning is, is that as a pastor at your church, I need to make sure that there's accountability around me that doesn't allow me to fall for temptations that would lead me to false teaching. Those are my two warnings. Here's the main point of the text, a warning for me and a warning for you, what we need to get out of this passage today. I'm gonna to warn you uh, that we don't have slides, and so if you're a note taker, you're gonna to have to get your pen out and follow with me. I'll try to remember that and talk slower on the main points. The main point of our sermon today is this. We are warned about false teachers so that we can discern their motives before they do irreversible harm. We are warned about false teachers so that we can discern their motives before they do irreversible harm. Peter wrote to his audience, a church that was not unlike us, because he didn't want them to fall for false prophets. He loved them. He didn't want them to walk away from the faith. He wanted them to persevere, persevere in their faith, to persevere on mission, to persevere for God's glory. Today, my prayer is, is that you will be able to discern false prophets by the end of our time together. That when you hear false teaching, that you'll know it. You won't fall for it. That you'll persevere in the faith for God's glory. I pray that there's not a single person in this room or that hears this passage read or hear, her, hears it preached that will suffer an irreversible harm that comes from following and absorbing and hearing false prophets, false teaching. So with that said, laying the stage for where we're going to be today, we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 22. We're going to start off by reading just verses uh, 10 through 16, actually just the second half of verse number 10. So if you would, if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to open it up. There's extra Bibles in the back. If you forgot yours, you need to track one down. We're in 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 10 through 16, just the second half of verse number 10. Peter talking about these false prophets. This is what he said. He said, bold, arrogant people. 
They are not afraid to slander the glorious ones. However, angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a slanderous charge against them before the Lord. But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, they slander what they do not understand, and in their destruction, they too will be destroyed." They will be paid back with harm for, ha- for the harm that they have done. They consider it pleasure to carouse in broad daylight, their spots and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. They seduce unstable people and have hearts trained in greed, children under a curse. They've gone astray by abandoning the straight path and have followed the path of Balaam, the son of Boser, who loved the wages of wickedness, but received a rebuke for his lawlessness. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. I'm going to make an assumption today as we get started that the vast majority of you are familiar with the movie or the book. I think it's a book, The Wizard of Oz. Is The Wizard of Oz a book? Yeah, so, so I just know the movie, haven't read it, sorry. The Wizard of Oz, if you haven't read it in a while, haven't watched it in a while, let me give you a brief overview. Dorothy, main character, she lives in Kansas. Tornado takes her away. She lands in Oz, and she's trying to follow the yellow brick road to get to the Wizard of Oz who will get her with the promise that if she gets there, that he can get her back to Kansas. Along the way, she meets some friends, the Tin Man, the Straw Man, and the Lion, And they work their way uh, on this trail, the yellow brick road, and they get to the Wizard of Oz. When they get to the Wizard of Oz, he says, I can't help you until you uh, bring back the Wicked Witch of the West, until you bring back her broom, and at that point, I'll be able to help you. Well, that leads to another adventure in which a pail of water gets thrown at the Wicked Witch of the West, I think, and she dissolves. It's a great story. You should watch it sometime. And then they come back with the broom. They come to the Wizard of Oz with the broom, and they realize something. With the help of Dorothy's dog, Toto, who goes to a curtain and begins to pull, they discover that the Wizard of Oz is actually no wizard at all. They see the truth of what's behind the curtain of that wizard. Today, as we think about a fitting illustration for false teachers and understanding what their motives are, I think that this is a great one. Many false teachers have a trustworthy uh, facade. Everything looks great on the outside. Everything looks trustworthy on the outside. But when the curtain is pulled back, and their true motives are revealed, we find that the false teacher has a deprived, sinful heart that's been hidden behind the curtain. That leads us to our first point, a point that if you're taking notes, you need to write down. The first point, section of our sermon today is the motivation of the false teacher. What drives the teacher? What is the heart of the false teacher? Behind the curtain of these false teachers In their lives, we often find three primary sins, according to Peter, as he teaches through this passage, as he writes to this church. He says that those three sins are pride or arrogance, lust, and greed. He names those three sins, pride, lust, and greed. We see the arrogance of the false teachers in verses uh, 10 through 13. Paul says, bold, arrogant teachers, bold, arrogant people. They are so bold, they are so arrogant, he says, that they aren't afraid to slander. Another word would be to blaspheme. They're not afraid to slander or blaspheme anyone. They're not afraid of it. There's a lot of conversation among uh, biblical uh, theologians and commentators about exactly who these glorious ones are that Peter's talking about. It's one of those things that uh, Peter leaves vague, and we are going to leave it vague this morning because we can't speak with certainty about who they are. Hundreds of years ago, the early church thought that those glorious ones were the church fathers. They were the pastors, the elders. He said that these 
people, these false prophets, they, didn't, they were so arrogant that they didn't even feel bad about talking about their pastor, the elder, the leader of their church. But most likely, as we look at the passage, what Peter's actually talking about is fallen angels or demons. He says that these false prophets are so bold, they're so arrogant, that they're not even afraid to speak of these glorious be- beings. The reason that we think that that's what, who uh, Peter's referring to here is that he contrasts these uh, evil be these a- evil angels with good angels in, in verse number 11. Peter's contrasting demons and angels. There's all kinds of questions uh, that have to go with that. If you want to talk about that later, I'm more than happy to give you some books that will probably lead both of us to decide that we don't really understand exactly what Peter was talking about. Here's the main point that you need to hear from what Peter says in these first few verses. He says that false teachers are so arrogant and bold that they aren't even afraid to speak down to demons. That's how arrogant and bold they were. False teachers aren't afraid of anything. They're so arrogant, so full of pride, so confident and sure of themselves that they don't believe that anything could ever harm them. Peter says that even the angels don't do this. They don't mock or speak arrogantly of demons. In Jude, verses 8 and 9, it's a parallel to 2 Peter. We see an example or a further explanation about what Peter may be talking about here. He says in verses 8 and 9 in Jude, he says, In the same way these people, talking about false prophets, relying on their dreams, they defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious ones. Yet when Michael, the archangel, archangel, angel, was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, talking about Satan. But what did he say? He said, the Lord rebuke you. The false prophet has an arrogant heart. He doesn't think that he can be touched. He doesn't think he'll ever be caught. He can say what he wants about what he wants, and there will be no consequences for the words that he says. God's angels aren't even this way. They know God. They know the demons, and they're afraid to say something that's out of their authority. They understand that it is God who has the authority, authority over the powers over this world, authority over all. Now, there are some obvious implications that come with this. The first implication is is that evil angels or demons do exist in our world. They exist. And when we encounter those type angels, our call to them, our response to them is that we should appeal to God. We should follow more closely who our Jesus is. We should focus our attention on who God the Father is. We should know his word. We should pray to him. We should obey his word. We should walk and know him. If we encounter the evil of the spiritual world, our response to the evil in this world is to appeal to God's authority, the God who has authority over all. And we should focus our energy and our attention on following him. Our role in spiritual warfare is to know our God and to walk with him humbly. There's another implication that's in this passage. While false prophets around the world False teachers may speak as if they have authority over demons and things in the spiritual world. The only authority over the spiritual world is the one true God. Those are implications of what Peter says here. That's obvious. But there's another subtle implication that Peter leaves us with. Here's the subtle implication. That as we seek to discern false teachers... As we listen to people teach, as we listen to people preach, what should we be listening to? We should be watchful for the pride in that person's life. As I look back over my life, as I think about those men in my life that fell, and I think to myself, I ask myself the question, how did I, how did I not see it? I was with that. How many cups of coffee did I drink with that man without ever seeing what it was that there was something wrong there? As I think about all of those men that I've known in my life, as I think about who they were and what they were, I look for hints as to why I didn't pick it up. The one thing that I can point back to is that there was always a hint, a trace of pride in what they did. 
It was always there. It was the single characteristic that should have tipped me off that this person shouldn't have been trusted, that I should have been more, more discerning about them. Now, it takes a certain amount of confidence to stand up every week in front of a bunch of people and, and pretend that you uh, want to listen to uh, anyone open God's Word and talk. There's a certain amount of confidence that's needed to do what I'm doing even right now. That confidence, though, has to be rooted not in oneself, but in one Savior. You see, when it's rooted in ourself, we call that pride and arrogance. The world will tell us that a great leader, a great pastor, they command the platform. When they walk on the stage, they've got control of what's happening up here. They draw everyone's attention. They have control. They command the platform. The Bible teaches us that the greatest teacher commanded the prayer room. That's who we should trust today. Peter says the prideful teacher is ultimately like an irrational animal, an animal that's born to be destroyed. He says they will be destroyed ultimately by their own arrogance. That's a common theme in all of these sins that you'll need to follow as we continue to work through these passages. False teachers, false prophets will be destroyed by the sin that's behind the curtain of their life. The second sin that we see after arrogance is the sin, the heart issue of false teachers is lust. Peter uh, writes about it. He says, these false teachers, they consider it pleasure to carouse in broad daylight. They are spots and blemishes, delighting in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery that never stop looking for sin. A person's eyes will follow their heart's desire. Years ago, uh, that might mean that we would... Uh, pay attention for head turns. Today, what it means is that we need to pay attention to the viewing history on a web browser. The appetite of our heart will direct our eyes. Where are your eyes drawn today? Where are the eyes drawn of the teacher or the preacher or the pastor that you're listening to? Pay attention. Eyes filled with lust are insatiable. They'll never be satisfied. They, ha they never have enough eyes like that. So as Peter says, their desires will eventually move from darkness where lust often starts. Eventually, those lustful eyes will be so insatiable that they will move from the shadows to broad daylight. Rather than being spotless and blameless, they become spots and blemishes on the church when their sin is revealed. We can recall pastor after pastor, name, name after name of pastors who've not only destroyed their ministry, but they've harmed the testimony and the witness of the church because they've fallen for sin, the sin of sinfulness, the sin of lust. David Helm is a pastor and a commentator. He was writing on this passage. He said this, he said, thankfully, God has, all, has ways of bringing these eyes out into the open. For the glory of his name, the purity of the church, and the welfare of every believing Christian, man, woman, and child, God will disclose the pastor's heart in the presence of the assembly. Beware of lustful eyes. Beware of arrogant pride. And then finally we see the third sin. The heart of the false prophet is motivated by pride, lust, and greed. Peter says their hearts are trained in greed. Another way to translate that in the original language is to say that they are proficient in greed. When you're learning a new language, you want to be proficient in that language. You want to obtain the point that you're an expert in it. These false prophets, they're proficient in greed. They're experts in wanting and trying to take what they want. Peter goes on to give an example of Balaam. Balaam's one of the most interesting stories in all of Scripture. It's one that kids love to think about because it's really strange. Balaam was a prophet of God. A foreign king came to Balaam. 
And he came to him with a bribe and he said, Balaam, if you would, I'll give you this bribe if you'll come give a prophecy against God's people for me so that when we go out to war that I'll have a prophet on my side. Well, Balaam at first, he refused to do that. But then the king came back and the bribe got a little bit bigger. And Balaam, well, he started to reconsider what God had actually said to him. He had a greedful heart. That price seemed too good to let go. And so he made a commitment. Well, I, I'll go there and see what happens when I get there. Balaam was so greedy, he couldn't say no to that amount of money. His heart was so full of greed, it betrayed him. Peter said in our passage today that it made him mad. He was mad like crazy, like all that he could think about was, those, was that money. Even though he knew that he couldn't speak for God, he gets on a donkey and he begins to go prophesy against God's people. Balaam would eventually have the strangest of people rebuke him. A human voice would come from a donkey and he would be turned back by God's angel. Some of you have heard me share this before. Uh, I probably will share it again. I served in Argentina for a long time and we worked with pastors. I sat on a number of ordination councils. For those of you that don't know what ordination council is, before a pastor is ordained to be a pastor, they go through a time of questioning. One of the last questions that we would ask every pastor before they were ordained was this, what's your means of accountability for these three things in your life? What's your means of accountability for power? What's your means of accountability for your relationships with people of the opposite sex? And what's your means of accountability for, for money? Whether a pastor would be ordained or not would oftentimes be dependent on how he answered that question. We knew that every pastor was going to be tempted in those ways. The question was, was did they have a fence built up to hold them accountable so they wouldn't fall into that sin? You see, the pastors that I worked with in Argentina had learned an important lesson. The most likely way to determine whether a pastor would be faithful over time was not his current theological stances, but his commitment to live a holy life by building accountability into his life. Do you want to know long-lasting who the pastors are that will be faithful Every pastor can say the right thing theologically today, but not every pastor will build into their lives accountability to hold them accountable to be faithful tomorrow. Why is it so important? Because false teachers don't just bring destruction upon themselves, but also upon those that follow after them. Peter says that these false teachers, they seduce unstable people. Why is discipleship so important? Why is it so important that each of us know God's word and obey God's word? Why is it so important? Because it allows us to discern false teachers and false and false teachers, false teachers and false teaching. It keeps us from being seduced by untruth because unstable people, people who don't know God's word, people who haven't been discipled, People not grounded in God's truth. They are people who will also be attracted to teaching that gives them the promise of a, free, of a false freedom, a freedom from sin, a freedom that doesn't convict them of their sin. People that aren't grounded in God's word will be seduced by these false teachers. The word seduce here is an interesting one. For those of you that like to fish, you'll enjoy it. These false teachers bait their hook with these false teaching. And it tickles the ears of the unstable and undiscipled, and it hooks them to take them somewhere that they never wanted to go. That brings us to the second point of our passage, verses 17 through 20. The second point is this, if you're taking notes, the way of the false prophet. Where is the pathway? Where's the end? Where do false prophets take us, if we're seduced by them, if we're hooked by them, where is the final destination? If unstable people are seduced into, falling, into following false prophets, it's important for us to know the way, the pathway that the false prophets will lead us on, lead us down, and where its ultimate destination lies. Let's look at verses 17 through, 9, 17 through 19 first. 
says these people, false prophets, they are springs without water, mist driven by a storm. The gloom of darkness has been reserved for them. For by uttering boastful, empty words, they seduce the fleshly desires and debauchery. People who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. In John chapter 4, Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman beside a well. He asked her, if she wanted living water. And then in verse number 13, he gave an explanation to her as to what he was talking about. He looked at the well beside him and he said, everyone who drinks of this water, the water that comes from the well, they'll get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give them will never get thirsty again. In fact, Jesus said, the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Later in John chapter 7, Jesus would talk about living water again. Verses 37 and 38, he said, on the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. Do you see the comparison here? The comparison between Jesus, living water, giving us springs that will well up and provide for us so that we're never thirsty again in comparison to the dry springs of the false teacher. Jesus says the water that comes from him will be completely satisfying. It will be eternal that those who follow him will have these springs welling up within them. The false teacher, though, on the other hand, is a spring without water. The false teacher gives all the appearances of a spring, but none of the water. He is a promise. He is a longing. He is a hope that's left unfulfilled. These springs without water are just like mist without rain. You see, mist provide, promise, water. At creation, it was the mist that came up from the land and watered the earth. A farmer sees mist over the field, and what does he expect? He expects his fields to be watered. That's what happens when mist sits over a field. Water comes. Peter, though, he says, the teaching of this false teacher has the appearance of truth but it lacks the substance of truth. It's like mist without water. It's like a spring without the fresh water that flows from that spring. You've probably heard a sermon or a lesson sometime in your life that's like this. A pastor or a teacher, they maybe open up the Bible and they read a passage, and then they give a series of stories or jokes or illustrations. You might... uh, learn a lot about the pastor, but you learn very little about what the Bible says, about what God says. A committed follower of Jesus that goes to that well will leave unsatisfied. You can remember the story or the joke, but not what the passage of Scripture said, not what God's voice said. You're left hungry for God's Word. You went to a well without water. Peter says the end of the false teacher's path will be the gloom of darkness. But the words of the false teacher sound good, we think. He commands the platform. He draws a crowd. The audience laughs and applauds when he tells his stories or his joke. His boasting seems to give all of the people around him confidence, even though his words are empty. You see, there's a saying that Uh, my team gets to hear whenever they talk to me and we talk about what it means to be a pastor, what it means to teach, what it means to preach, that what my team hears from me is character over charisma every time. Character over charisma every time. Character of life. Is the person living a godly life? Is the person teaching is his character? Is it, does he have character in his teaching? Character of life, character over teaching, over the charisma of the false teacher. 
Not only are the words of the false teacher empty of God's power, but they're full of promises that allow for the audience's fleshly desires and debauchery, Peter says. And when Peter writes this, there's no way to interpret the passage without understanding that Peter's actually talking, giving sexual connotation to what this is in the text. Peter says the words of false teachers promise freedom, freedom from the inconvenient call to Scripture, a call of Scripture to holiness. You see, more and more in our society, if we're honest, it seems that Christians will be known by our stance towards sexuality. Far too often, the evangelical church, we've done a terrible job in sharing with people who are in sexual sin. We've done it in an unloving way. We've not shown them the love of Christ and the gospel. But probably, just as often as we've failed to share the love of Christ with those that are in sexual sin, we've failed to lovingly call for repentance of those who are in our church that are in other types of sexual sin. We failed to call them to repent. We failed to call them and teach them about God's design for our sexuality. Every child and student in our church and in our community today will have to answer questions about their gender and about their sexuality, where all of us who are Generation X and above, we didn't even have cable or or internet. We have to teach what God's Word says about gender. We have to teach what God's Word says about His design for sexuality, that marriages are between one man and one woman. But we also have to teach that that marriage is supposed to last as long as we shall live. It is a lifelong commitment. Many in the evangelical world today, when we talk about standing for biblical principles of gender and sexuality, we stand up and we celebrate. But unfortunately, we affirm with our silence the devastating effect that pornography has had on our society. Oftentimes, pastors don't confront it because they don't want to be held accountable to it either. I'm not sure today that the blight of pornography is not the root cause for all of those issues around gender and sexuality issues that are in our world today. Kids are growing up in a world where parents have been hooked on pornography, and I said parents, both mom and dad, hooked on pornography in such a way that they were confused and allowed their kids to live and to answer questions without them there. False teachers promise sexual freedom. But as Peter says in verse 19, this so-called sexual freedom is is in fact enslaving people. This is the pathway the false teacher will lead us on. A path that's final destination is darkness and gloom. And as you travel down that pathway, you'll be enslaved by the chains of your own sinful desires. People are enslaved by the sin that defeats them. Do you want to know who your master is today? Your master is that sin that you can't get past. It's the sin that you don't want to give up. It's the sin you don't want to repent of. It's the sin that you won't give to God and take his power to step away from and to turn from. People's, Peter's frustration concerning the false prophets who have infiltrated the church that he loves, they culminate in the last three verses. Look in verse uh, 20 through 22. Peter writes, For if having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated. The last state is worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them It would have been better for these false prophets if they had never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. It's happened to them. It has happened to them according to the proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit and a washed sow returns to wallowing in the mud. Peter says it would have been better for these false prophets if they had never known what righteousness was at all. You see, in order to be a false teacher, you have to have had some knowledge of the truth. Now, don't be confused here. These false prophets 
never accepted the truth, but they knew the truth. Their knowledge of the truth allowed them to give false teaching. Peter isn't saying these teachers put their faith in Jesus. He's saying that they knew the truth, but rather than walk in the truth, they took another route. And that route led, will lead them to a judgment that's even worse than what it would have been if they had just never known the truth at all. You see, we all get into heaven by grace, but our punishment is not always the same. Greater is the punishment of the person who leads others to hell than the person who just wanders in on their own. Then Peter gives some pictures. He compares these false teachers to a dog returning to its vomit or a washed pig wallowing in the mud. Now those are pictures that if you've ever seen them before, they elicit an immediate reaction. They make you respond in a certain way. What do you think about when you think about those three things? You turn your head and you're like, no, 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 don't do that. Maybe your dog that you love goes to do the dumb thing and you're like, stop, and you don't want to watch it do it. You think about an animal that you've just washed, you care for it, and all of a sudden you let it out into the yard, and what does it do? There's a mud hole. And what does that clean animal do? No, 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 no. Those pictures elicit from us immediate answer. Whatever you do, don't do that. You're in worse shape now than you were before. That's what Peter's saying. He said, God's cleaned you. He's cleaned them. He's given them truth. He's, they've seen what it means to follow after him, and they've went back into the mud. As I thought about those people in my life, I've thought and asked myself the question, well, do I share anything about those people? Maybe it would be helpful to know examples of what those false prophets that Kevin knows about, what they look like. Today I won't do that because I'm still holding out hope that some of those false prophets and some of those people that I love that are following those false prophets will have a chance to come back to grace. There's still hope for them. But you need to understand today that those people that I know, those that claim to be walking in righteousness and we were revealed to be walking in unrighteousness, their lives are more miserable today than they were before. They're like the sow that was cleaned and went back to wallow in the mud. Walking away from Jesus will ruin your life. We will be judged according to our deeds. Were we faithful or were we unfaithful? Peter's message to this church has echoes of the message that he would have heard from Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, this is what Jesus said, what Peter would have heard about false teachers. Jesus said, be on your guard against false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes and figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces, every good tree produces good fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad fruit, bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. That's what Jesus says about false prophets. Do you want to know who a false teacher is? Look at their fruit. He goes on. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Guys, today Satan seeks to destroy those that he can, to devour you to devour your pastors, just as he did among the church that Peter was addressing in his original audience. The message of God's word for us today is clear. Beware of false teachers. 
Persevere in faithfulness. Know God's word. Obey God's word. Walk in God's word. And when you hear something that doesn't align with God's word, turn and go in the other direction. The main point of our sermon, we are warned about false teachers so that we can discern their motives before they do irreversible harm. If you're sitting here today and you've fallen for the lies of false teachers, those teachers may have stood in a pulpit or they may have come to you on social media or they may be on your favorite news channel. No matter where those false teachers have come, no matter where they have taken you, there's still time to turn back to Jesus. There's still time to know his word, to obey his word, and to walk with him. Peter didn't write this letter to condemn the church. Peter wrote this letter so that the church would have a chance to be called back to him, to be called back to walking in righteousness. Commit yourself today to know and to obey God's word, even when it teaches you things that you don't want to hear. True freedom comes from knowing and experiencing God's redemption from sin by putting our faith in him, by walking according to his commands. If you're sitting here today and you've fallen into the same sins of the false teachers, if you've got pride in your heart, you've talked to someone or someones about God's children, maybe. Slander has been on your lips. If that's you, then forgiveness is waiting if you'll just turn back. That's what Peter wants you to hear today. Turn back. Maybe you're sitting here and your life is enslaved by lust, desires of your flesh. Maybe you need to give over those sinful desires of your heart to the Lord. You need to confess them and you need to walk away from them. Ask for God's power to help you overcome those sins. Maybe you need to ask a friend that's sitting next to you, can you give me some accountability so that I don't fall into the temptation that I have? You haven't honored God's design for your sexuality. Maybe you haven't honored God's design for your marriage. If that's you, forgiveness is waiting for you if you just turn back. And then there's that third sin. Maybe you've fallen into the trap of greed. You're pursuing money at the expense of your walk with the Lord. You're robbing him by not giving him of your first fruits. If that's you, today there's forgiveness waiting for you if you'll just turn back. Pastor Peter wrote his last letter to a church that he loved. He didn't write them this letter with all this stuff about these false teachers to condemn them. He wrote them this letter because he loved them, because he didn't want to see those people that he loved walking down that path anymore, and he's calling them back. Please come back. Please don't walk in that sin anymore. God's design is so much better. Today, The message of the Lord for you is this, come back. If you're on that passage, if you're on that path, it's not too late, you can come back. Forgiveness lies over here in the sacrifice of Jesus. You can walk in righteousness by his power. You're not doomed for that path. Please come back. Just a moment, we're gonna have the Lord's Supper together. I've prayed a lot about how to close this sermon today. Um, I want to do something that I don't normally do. No one ever sits on the front row at Brainerd Baptist Church. We do that because uh, we want to save those seats in case someone wants to come pray. I don't think that's why, but that's what we're going to say, right? (laughs) Makes us feel better. If you're sitting here today, and you've been walking down a path, a path of pride, pride that's led you to slander and to speak evil of God's, God's people, if that's you today, if you're sitting here today and you're trapped by sexual sin, that could come in any flavor or color. If you're sitting here today and greed has ruled your life, if any of those things are you, You can find victory today 
by giving those sins over to Jesus. So before we have the Lord's Supper, I want, as we sing this last song, for you to have the opportunity to come pray. I promise you that if you do come pray, there'll be somebody to pray with you. If no one comes, that's okay too. But I wonder, I wonder today if there's not somebody, there's not someone here that wants freedom from sin. If that's you, please come pray today. Please come give it to the Lord. Please lay down your pride and know Jesus. Let's sing together. If you need to come, please come. testimony to be built here, glory to be given. So please, church, take this time. Let's not let this be another Sunday where we just sit here and we sing together and have a great time and leave. Let's get free. Let's set our minds on heaven. Let's live these last days like they matter.
Jesus, if you've made that first step of following him in faith of baptism, I would encourage you to remember Jesus' words as you recommit to him to follow in his pathway. First Corinthians, Paul writes about, uh, about the Lord's Supper. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. said, for as often as you eat this bread, as often as you drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We want to dismiss today the same way we always do, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you one more time, if the Lord is dealing in your life, if you want to know what freedom is, if you've been going down a path that takes you to the path of destruction, Please don't walk out of here today down that path. Come talk to a pastor, talk to a Christian that brought you in. Our prayer at Brainerd as we close every week is the same. We pray that God would be gracious to us, gracious to forgive us, that he would bless us by empowering us to overcome sin, that he would make his face to shine on us, that his goodness and his mercy and his kindness would just shine on our lives as we know what forgiveness is that his way would be known on earth, that those around us would see our lives and they would want to follow, not just us, not us, but they would want to follow him, that his salvation would be known among all the nations. Today, as you walk out, we pray that you'd walk out in the love and the peace of Jesus Christ. But we also pray that you'll walk out in freedom, freedom from your sins, freedom in such a way that allows you to be his witness among all the people. Go in the peace and the love of Jesus Christ. I can't wait to see you again next week.